There are so many multifunctional plants we can grow that benefit wildlife, soil conditions, and provide us with food and herbal medicine. It is so exciting to see a plant that I love utilizing for fresh herbal teas, also providing nectar to the wild honeybees. Or a plant that I've been using to make healing salves for pain and inflammation, also doing a great deal when it comes to healing the soil conditions. I never imagined that planting these three beautiful flowering herbs together would create a high-traffic, busy, buzzing, bustling city for the bees. The flowers are ornamental, they attract pollinators, and I get to utilize them for herbal teas and other herbal preparations as well. In today's video, I would like to highlight five of these fantastic herbs. Perhaps we can take a deeper dive into some of these plants in the future, but for now, the main point I'd like to get across in this video is that herbs we can use medicinally can also help heal and benefit the land and the ecosystem in many ways. First, I thought we would start our list off with bee balm. Bee balm is a perennial plant which is native to North America. It is a member of the Lamiaceae or mint family and can be grown in the USDA hardiness zones three through eight. As the name suggests, it attracts a large amount of bees to the garden, as well as butterflies and different types of moths. The most interesting moth I have seen feeding from bee balm are these moths that look like little lobsters with wings. Bee balm also benefits some species of birds, including hummingbirds who fancy drinking bee balm's nectar, and some species of songbirds utilize the seeds as fall and winter forage. Not only does bee balm end up attracting a lot of beneficial pollinators and wildlife, but it is also known to repel unwanted garden pests. It is also a rabbit and deer resistant plant due to its strong taste and odor. This specific species of bee balm is Monarda fistulosa, which is also known as wild bee balm. There are about 20 different species within the Monarda genus of flowering plants, all of which are native to North America. Of course, planting native plants will always benefit the local wildlife, and the cool thing about this one is it can be grown or even foraged as a native spice, with a scent and flavor very similar to oregano. Other species of Monarda also have a slight oregano flavor to them, which makes the leaves and flowers great additions to savory dishes, especially using them in place of oregano or thyme. Monardo fistulosa definitely has a stronger oregano flavor compared to some of the other species. This intense oregano flavor actually says a lot about some of the medicinal properties as well. Thymol is a compound found within plants and is especially potent in herbs like oregano, thyme, and this here bee balm. Thymol is known for its strong antiseptic properties, and because of this, it is the main active ingredient in many mouthwashes, including Listerine. Monarda fistulosa was utilized by about 15 different Native American tribes for medicine, and some of the most common uses from different tribes were to brew a tea from its leaves to alleviate colds, flus, and fevers, for oral infections, skin infections, digestive complaints, and headaches. Bee balm is still utilized in these ways in herbal medicine today. Because bee balm is anti-inflammatory, antifungal, and antibacterial, it makes for a great wound healing plant. Bee balm is also considered a carminative herb, which relieves digestive discomforts like gas, bloating, stomach cramps, and diarrhea. Bee balm has also shown antitussive properties, meaning it helps to relieve coughs, and certain extracts and essential oils made from Monarda fistulosa have shown possible immunomodulating and antiviral properties making it a great herb for adding to cold and flu preparations. There aren't any known side effects when taking bee balm, but before utilizing any medicinal herbs, it is always best to check with a healthcare professional first. 
Next is Echinacea purpurea, which is a plant loved by home gardeners, wildflower enthusiasts, herbalists, butterflies, bees, and many types of birds. It is a member of the Asteraceae or daisy family and is another native plant to North America, which can be grown in the USDA hardiness zones 3 through 9. Like bee balm, Echinacea is another plant that deer and rabbits don't eat, and because it is so easy to grow, it is a native plant, it provides food for wildlife, and it is absolutely beautiful. It makes a very popular plant for landscaping in North America. There are nine wild species of Echinacea that grow east of the Rocky Mountains, with Echinacea purpurea being one of the most widely grown and used for herbal medicine today. Echinacea was traditionally used by some Native American tribes externally for wounds, burns, bug bites, chewing on the roots for toothaches and infections in the throat, and internally for coughs, pains, cramps, and even snake bites. Today, Echinacea is most popularly used for its immune-boosting properties, especially when it comes to staving off and fighting cold and flu viruses. While some studies done using echinacea to prevent and treat the common cold had good results, others showed echinacea having little to no effect. However, this could partially be due to the fact that the echinacea extracts used from study to study were vastly different. Either way, there is no doubt that echinacea does have an immune-boosting effect, and research shows echinacea's ability to increase white blood cell production, which aids the body in fighting off all sorts of infections. Echinacea is also known to relieve pain and inflammation, have antibacterial, antifungal, and antioxidant effects. Echinacea is a favorite for herbalists when it comes to overall immune system support and to aid in clearing out infections whether they are viral, bacterial, or fungal. The plant constituents found within echinacea that are mostly recognized for its effect on the immune system are alchemides, which are found mainly in the roots, and polysaccharides, which are found in higher concentrations in the leaves and flowers. The most common side effects of taking echinacea are nausea and upset stomach. People with known allergies may be more susceptible to an allergic reaction from echinacea, especially if you are already allergic to other plants in the Asteraceae or daisy family. The next herb is Korean mint or Korean hyssop. I planted this herb about four years ago from seed, and though it is a short-lived perennial that comes back for a few years, it is also an aggressive self-seeder, meaning it will plant its own seed in the garden every year and it will come back. So every spring, I see more Korean mint seedlings popping up, which is always a nice treat. As the name suggests, this plant is native to Korea, as well as China, Japan, and some other countries in Eastern Asia. It can be grown in the USDA hardiness zones 4 through 9. It is a member of the Lamiaceae, or mint family, but unlike many other mints, it does not sprawl along the ground and take over areas, so it really is a great addition to any area of the garden. This is an herb that has a strong anise, or sweet licorice smell and taste, just like the closely related anise hyssop. It is also a rabbit and deer resistant plant due to its strong taste and odor. And it may also help to distract or repel different garden pests. Its strong, sweet anise flavor makes it a lovely addition to herbal teas, syrups, and other edible herbal preparations. Its beautiful spiked flowers are a gorgeous addition to flower beds, and I love using Korean mint as a cut flower because it adds a nice vertical element and lovely scent to bouquets. When blooming, the beautiful purple flowers are almost always covered in bees, and I always catch little bumble buddies taking naps on the flower spikes. It also attracts butterflies, hummingbirds, and I often see finches nibbling on the dried seed heads in the fall and winter. Korean mint is one of the 50 fundamental herbs of traditional Chinese medicine. It is considered a warming herb and is used to cure dampness in the digestive and respiratory tract. In traditional Chinese medicine, it is utilized as a carminative herb to aid digestion, ease bloating, to help with upset stomachs, nausea, indigestion, diarrhea, and it also helps with morning sickness. 
I do add this herb into tea blends for upset stomachs, and because of its strong and sweet anise flavor, I really enjoy adding the leaves and flowers into tea blends with other herbs that don't taste as great. It does a good job of masking less than desirable herbal flavors or adding a pleasant flavor to bland herbs. Because it is anti-inflammatory, antimicrobial, it freshens the breath and has a sweet flavor, this is one that I have added into an experimental homemade toothpaste. And it would also make a nice addition to a homemade mouthwash. The next plant is one of my favorites for making fresh herbal teas, and this is what I used to know as holy basil. I feel like the information I have on this plant isn't as strong as the others, however it is a beautiful plant with a very pleasant and unique aroma that is great for making teas and providing nectar for the bees. This specific species of holy basil is called Tulsi Kapoor which technically may not even be a true holy basil, but is categorized as one today. It is also sometimes referred to as temperate Tulsi, since it does so well grown as an annual in temperate climates, and it readily self-seeds. For the past three years, this lovely herb has come back to our garden just from self-seeding alone. Like other basils, it is a part of the Lamiaceae or mint family. When it comes to Tulsi Kapoor, there is actually some confusion surrounding the exact species and the origin of the plant, so you may find it being labeled under different species names. Though it is hard to find information specifically on this species, I figured I would give a brief overview of how this one and other holy basils are utilized as an herbal medicine. In India, holy basils have been regarded as sacred herbs for thousands of years and have been used for medicinal, religious, and ceremonial purposes in many Hindu traditions. They are prominent herbs in Ayurvedic medicine and have a wide range of uses. One of the most popular uses today is as an adaptogenic herb. Adaptogens help the body to, well, better adapt to physical, emotional, and environmental stressors and toxins, helping bring more balance to both the body and the mind. Because of its ability to aid in reducing stress, holy basil is also used as a nervine tonic in herbal medicine to help calm the nerves and also help with depression and anxiety. Holy basils are loaded with antioxidants, have antimicrobial, anti-inflammatory, and anaglesic properties as well, so it is an herb that can be used for wound healing and reducing pain. There is so much more that holy basils have been used for, and there have been some studies done with the other species of holy basils. However, like I mentioned earlier, it is difficult to find information specific to this species of Tulsi. Traditionally, all parts of Tulsi, including the roots and seeds, have been used for making herbal preparations, with the leaves being the most commonly used for making herbal teas. Harvesting or just walking by Kapoor Tulsi is always a delight because it gives off such a sweet and unique herbal aroma. Because of its distinct, strong smell, Kapoor Tulsi has traditionally been used to repel mosquitoes and other insects. However, the flowers attract many bees to the garden. I often see wild honeybees going crazy for the Kapoor Tulsi flowers. It is difficult to describe the exact scent and flavor of this plant since it is so complex. The scent is somewhat sweet and spicy like clove, but it is also somewhat reminiscent of a fruity bubblegum. The taste doesn't have much of this fruitiness to it, but instead it's a little minty and slightly spicy like clove with a hint of bitterness. This complex fruity scent and slightly spicy, lightly bitter flavor is why I have named this plant Bittersweet Bubblegum Yum Yum Plant. I have made one of my favorite summertime iced herbal teas with Bittersweet Bubblegum Yum Yum Plant by making my own twist on Strawberry Basil Lemonade, which is Strawberry Holy Basil Grapefruit Aid. Mmm, it is very good. The next herb is one that we have grown the longest in our garden. In fact, it was the first perennial herbaceous plant that we added to the garden because it has such a wide variety of uses. Comfrey is a perennial herb in the Borignaceae family that is native to Europe and Asia. It will grow in a wide range of soil conditions and can be grown within the USDA hardiness zones 4 through 9. The only drawback to this plant is that it aggressively self-sows 
unless you have a variety of comfrey that produces sterile seed. And once established, comfrey is very difficult to remove from an area since any small root fragment left in the ground can easily regrow into a new plant. This is also the only plant on this list that will get nibbled on by the deer, so it might need some protection in areas with high deer pressure. Though comfrey isn't often used as a plant in flower beds, I find the bright lavender colored bell-shaped flowers to be absolutely stunning, and they are always swarmed with bees when in bloom. Besides attracting bees, comfrey is a plant that has many applications in the garden. In the permaculture world, this plant is known as a dynamic accumulator because its large tap roots reach far down into the ground, pulling up many nutrients and minerals which other plants may not have access to. And as the leaves die back and return to the soil, an incredibly nutrient-rich mulch forms, helping to improve soil conditions. Because of comfrey's ability to hold many nutrients, it is often planted next to fruit trees and shrubs, used as a chop and drop mulch, used for making compost tea for fertilizing plants, and it is also used as a green manure for compost piles. In fact, it is one of the best known compost activating plants, helping to heat up a compost pile by providing nitrogen rich material. I will eventually have to put out a detailed video on comfrey alone because of its many applications. But one of my favorite uses for comfrey is making it into a salve for bruises, muscle aches, pains, strains, and sprains. Comfrey was once used for a myriad of aches, pains, swellings, and wounds, and earned one of its common names, knit bone, due to the fact that it was once used for healing broken bones. Today, it is still used topically for easing pain and inflammation and helping to aid in the healing process altogether for internal wounds. Some clinical trials done using mostly comfrey root extracts in the form of topical creams have shown comfrey's ability to reduce back pain, joint pain, and pain associated with osteoarthritis. Other human studies have shown its ability to heal bruises, muscle strains, trauma to joints, and sprains by reducing pain, swelling, and tenderness, while also increasing mobility in the affected area. Perhaps one of comfrey's most fascinating and helpful healing properties is its ability to regenerate cells and tissue at a faster rate, and studies indicate that this may be due to the presence of allotonin within the plant. Comfrey was once used internally for many conditions, however it is no longer classified as safe for internal use, and this is because of the presence of paralizidine alkaloids. I don't know if I said that right. I don't know, but they are also called PAs. Because of the PAs contained within comfrey, there are some safety concerns in regard to using it as an herbal medicine. PAs are known to be toxic to the liver when taken internally, and they may also be absorbed into the bloodstream over time, which is why comfrey is usually not recommended to be used on open wounds or for everyday use. Most people who utilize comfrey medicinally do so with success and don't run into any problems, but it is important to know the possible risks. If you plan on adding comfrey into your herbal medicine chest, do your research and talk to a professional before use, especially if you have any existing health conditions. Both the roots and leaves of comfrey are the main parts used for making medicine. The roots are best dug up when the rest of the plant is dormant in early spring or late fall. The leaves are best harvested when the plant isn't flowering and can be used fresh as a poultice or dried out for oil and salve making as well. Comfrey may cause contact dermatitis in some people and because of the PAs it contains, caution should be taken. Well that sums it up for today's video talking about these five fantastic herbs let me know in the comments down below if you guys have any multifunctional herbs that you love to grow and why you love to grow them. Thank you so much for watching and have a lovely spring.